Thank you all for being here today. This is a briefing of the Select Committee on Global Warming and Energy Independence. And since its inception, uh, the Select Committee has held over 60 hearings on the impact of climate change and quest for energy independence. We have heard from top scientists, governors, foreign heads of state, and energy industry CEOs. Today, Congress will hear from perhaps the biggest stakeholders in the climate challenge, students and young leaders who represent the future of our economy, our nation, and our planet. The lessons of history show the power of activism. When young women were denied the right to vote, they formed the suffragette movement and changed the voting law. It was a group of students who sat in at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, that galvanized the civil rights movement, that gave the right to vote to minorities in the South. Young people rose up to end the war in Vietnam. Young people took a sledgehammer to the Berlin Wall. Today, this generation faces some of the deepest, most complex challenges our nation has ever confronted, an economy in peril, a broken energy system, a climate in crisis. Since this recession began, our economy has shed a staggering 3.6 million jobs. But the science shouts out a bigger threat. Unless we reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050, we will face a dire consequence. These problems require creative solutions. This weekend, over 12,000 young people from campuses across the country gathered in Washington, D.C. to take part in the largest student conference ever focused on climate and energy. They came by buses and trains, many sleeping on sofas and floors. They are choosing to spend their spring break breaks in session, focused on global warming's impact on the economy, human health, national security, culture, and faith. For students and the younger generation, the transition to a clean energy economy offers hope and opportunity. Investing in green jobs can provide a pathway out of poverty and lead to the creation of breakthrough technologies. The economic recovery package allocated up to $60 billion for clean energy projects that will increase wind turbine manufacturing and solar panel installation. Much of that money was put in the recovery package because of the activism of young people in the country who want a solution uh, to the problems of energy dependence and global warming. That legislation, along with the Green Jobs Act and the Energy Bill of 2007, was a good first step. But to truly launch a renewable revolution, Congress must pass climate legislation that will cap pollution and invest in the technology of tomorrow. It is a moral obligation that we owe to the children of the generation testifying today before Congress. President Kennedy started the Peace Corps. President Clinton called citizens to serve through AmeriCorps. Now is the time for the next generation to be part of the Clean Energy Corps, to build a new energy backbone. to build a new energy backbone for this country that harnesses the power of smart technology, puts people to work, and protects our planet. The Clean Energy Corps can produce green ambassadors working internationally with developing nations like India, China, and Brazil to collectively solve these global challenges. Together, this generation can help protect our oceans and rainforests and ensure that the snows of Kilimanjaro remain to inspire the next generation of Hemingways. We had the greatest generation, the baby boomers and Generation X, and now you, the green generation, are here to save our planet and to ensure that in doing so, we create the jobs that are going to be necessary for the next generation of citizens of our country and the planet. And we thank you for being here. Let me turn now to recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan, for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for allowing me to be with you today. Um, uh, we changed our schedule 
so that we could be here today to be able to listen to each and every one of you. Chairman Markey has done an incredible job in making sure that we as a Congress have an opportunity to hear from experts from all areas that will provide us the support that we need to be able to transform the way that we generate energy in our country, to provide a foundation for educational opportunities, to train the workforce of the 21st century. But by you coming together and ascending on the steps of Capitol Hill, of our United States Capitol here in Washington, D.C., shows that there's a movement across the country. But unless we put our words to action, and we put that action into law, we're going to face problems in the future. And understand the importance of making sure that others realize the power of your voice and continue to organize, continue to educate yourselves, and become the experts of the future so that we can continue to transform the world. You know, I had an opportunity to visit with students today, Mr. Chairman, in my office that came from New Mexico. And I had the honor of working uh, with them and on behalf of them, transforming the way that we would generate power in New Mexico. Chairman Markey has introduced legislation to establish a national renewable electricity standard, similar to the work that we did in states to establish a national or a state renewable portfolio standard. It's these brave efforts and this courage that is going to take to be able to change the way that we do things. I applaud your efforts. I thank you for allowing me to be here, Mr. Chairman, to be able to listen to the experts that we have today as we work in various committees to create educational opportunities, to create awareness in the importance of addressing climate change and global warming, transforming the way that we do things. Thank you to each and every one of you for making the commitment to be here with us, to educate us, and so that we can work on this together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Lujan, very much. And, uh, and now we're going to turn to our very distinguished panel. Our first witness this afternoon is Ms. Jessie Tolkien. Uh, Ms. Tolkien is the Executive Director of the, uh, uh, of the Energy Action Coalition, which is a coalition of 50 youth organizations from the United States and Canada. She has worked to plan Power Shift 2009, a conference in Washington, D.C. that gathered 12,000 young people this weekend to advocate to stop global warming and to start a green energy economy. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to be at the Convention Center this weekend, and it was an impressive sight to see. So, Jesse, uh, thank you for being here, and whenever you are ready, please begin. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chairman Markey, for having us here today. I apologize that the, the bold speaking over the weekend has taken my voice a bit. I want to thank you for your leadership on this topic. I have the honor of serving as the Executive Director of Energy Action, a coalition that has brought together 50 diverse social justice, environmental justice, and religious organizations from across the country in our pursuit of a clean and just energy future. The urgency and magnitude of the topics we come to discuss today could not be more pressing or more timely. We are here today as the voice of a generation pleading and demanding with you, you for urgent action to address our climate and energy crises. Over the course of the past three days, 12,000 of us gathered here in our nation's capital, from indigenous communities in North Dakota to coal communities in Kentucky. We are black, we are white, we are Latino, we are Latina, we are indigenous, we are Asian American, we hail from all 50 states and every single Canadian province and a dozen countries around the world. And what we've come here to remind you today is that the fight for clean and just energy, the fight for bold action on climate change is not just another bill. It is not just another political priority. It is not just another campaign promise. It is intricately, intricately wound up in the lives of the brave people that sit next to me and behind me today. 12,000 of us in Washington, D.C. this weekend, hundreds of thousands of young people around the country and millions more around the world cannot afford our Congress to longer, linger any longer. The science gets more terrifying with each new report. 
the climate cannot wait. Our dirty energy economy is failing us and the 3.6 million people that have lost their jobs. The economy, the unemployed Americans cannot wait. Our communities are getting sicker and sicker from dirty coal and oil and uranium mining. Our communities cannot wait. The international community is looking to us. The world cannot wait. In 2009, we implore this Congress to stand up and listen to the 24 million of us that headed to the polls on November 4th. We demand that you pass bold climate legislation in 2009. Over the course of these next months, as the oil lobby and the coal lobby and the gas lobby fill these halls, they will be trying to write the bill. They will plug our airwaves with ads. They will put money into the campaign funds of our elected officials. They will try to halt the progress that we know cannot be halted. I ask you to remember the faces of the people in this room today. Remember that a generation's future is on the line. We don't just need any climate bill. Let me be close, clear about that. We need the boldest, most aggressive action that has ever come out of this United States Congress. We need energy that is, we need a energy and climate policy that is just for every single person in this country and every single person around this world. We need dramatic short-term targets in terms of carbon reduction on the scale of 25 to 40% by 2020. We need an immediate moratorium on coal. We need the creation of 5 million new green jobs. We need even further investment in clean energy. We need you to pass this now. As political priorities pile up in the coming months and the politics heat up, please remember that we cannot wait. The world cannot wait. Let us help you in sending the strongest possible bill to President Obama's desk this year. Help us in achieving the clean and just energy future we all need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Our next uh, witness is Juan Reynosa. He works with young people in his home state of New Mexico, uh, in the home state of Congressman Lujan. I know he's very proud of you. Um, uh, on green jobs training programs in Albuquerque. Uh, we're glad to have you with us here today. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Well, thank you, Chairman Markey. I am definitely appreciative of this opportunity, and thank you as well, Congressman Lujan. It's great to see you here. Um, coming from my background, this is just an amazing opportunity. I never thought I'd be here, so I'm very appreciative. Again, my name is Juan Reynosa. I work with New Mexico Youth Organized out of Albuquerque. We're a youth group that looks to engage youth in their communities via youth retreats, uh, all ages events, and also supporting good legislation in regards to ethics, health care, and green jobs. I'm here to talk about my state of New Mexico. New Mexico has been burdened by the oil, gas, and uranium industries for many years now. The people in my state are in the great need of transition away from these dirty energy sources into something more sustainable and more clean for our environment. The people of New Mexico have a great opportunity ahead of them, and I feel that they're very deserving of this, especially having worked in a lot of these industries that have not given them much opportunity for career mobility, yet have taken advantage of the uh, environments that they live in and added a lot of pollution to those environments. Yet despite all of this, I am very hopeful that we are on the verge of something great. Um, we are definitely here with you today to talk about how we think we can help push this along. I grew up in a small southern town in New Mexico called Hobbs. Growing up there, I would walk, walk along the desert and see many abandoned oil sites. I also saw the impacts that this had on local ecosystems there. 
Not too many years have passed since a buried gas tanker near a neighborhood in Hobbs corroded and leaked this horrible substance into that neighborhood's water table. Many of my friends, their mothers, their, friend, their family got sick off of this. I have to ask, what have the people in that community done to deserve this besides what worked hard, long hours in these dirty industries only to be rewarded by them with a toxic slap in the face? My father has also worked in the oil industry for at least 30 years now. And despite him being a great worker in that entire time, they have rarely given him an opportunity to move, him, move himself up in the career ladder. I definitely feel he's amazingly skilled and intelligent enough to be contributing to a greater cause in his company, yet they haven't been wise enough to give him that opportunity. Many of my friends and family in my community are in the same position. They work in the oil field because it's the best paying job they can get. Yet I know they are capable of much more and they are just waiting for this opportunity to be able to further better their quality of life for themselves, their family, and thus the entire community. Yet recently I have been hearing about many of my friends and family losing their jobs in that community. And this is a result of the decline of oil production there. Sadly enough, the industries that the officials in my hometown have decided to bring in to help spur job growth have been the prison industry, the uranium industry, and the gambling industry. And it puzzles me because New Mexico is number two, that's correct, number two in the entire nation for solar potential and number 12 for wind potential. We are literally having opportunities shining down upon us, yet for some reason we're letting them blow right past us. We deserve the opportunity to take advantage of our state's huge potential, and I think this opportunity is right around the corner. I wanna see more of these opportunities for my friends and family that don't just provide a job, but a, a sustainable career, good benefits, and you know, just the pride of working in a good job in their community. These people in my community are hardworking, deserving people, and they deserve it. With so much opportunity for alternative energy use in our communities and such a high demand now for jobs, it makes no sense for us not to be tapping into these resources. And many of these resources that we could be tapping into right now besides solar and wind, we even have a chance at geothermal, which Iceland has had great success with. Many of my friends are doing alternative fuels from biodiesel, which I think is another great opportunity. And that's why many of the youth that work with me at New Mexico Youth Organize have taken it upon ourselves to start pushing for green jobs legislation on both the city and statewide level. And since we've begun this, we've had a great amount of community support. And the reason we've had this support is because many rural and tribal residents know that they need a better job that doesn't contribute to the degradation of the environment of their community. Tribes are tired of breathing polluted air from coal-fired power plants while getting none of that energy for their community. Some of these communities are so small yet they have higher pollution rates than LA. Our state knows it can do much better than this. In the urban areas, we have single mothers, people without jobs and people of low income needs, means who need this opportunity at a new career with good benefits and that's gonna be benefit them and their family. Not only that, but I would love to give another chance to our at-risk youth, ex-offenders, and people who haven't earned a high school diploma, much less a college degree. So many of my friends and family fit these descriptions, and I love them way too much for, to let them settle for jobs in industries that are not good enough for them. Van Jones said it the best when he says, if we're willing to recycle dead materials in this movement, then we better be willing to recycle living people because they deserve another chance as well. And I'm proud to say that many people are already taking action in my community. So many young people and old people are doing community garden work to help spur the local food movement. This is providing a lot healthier food to many young people who need it, a lot of low-income families, and it's also reducing greenhouse gases. Many of the other of my friends are making biodiesel uh, fuels from waste oil, and I think this is a fantastic idea because they're making fuel that is not coming from a dirty energy source, nor is it coming from a source that should be used for food. Even more of my friends are performing energy retrofits on the homes of low-income people. And this just makes me so happy to see the smiles on these low-income people's faces when they realize that they've made their home better and they're gonna be saving money through this action. All of these activities are examples of green jobs that are already going on, on, going on in my community. And I am greatly thankful for the amazing people who have took the initiative 
in both my city and in my hometown to make these things happen. Yet, despite many of what many of us on the ground level are doing, we need help on the federal level as well. People who are making these local foods and alternative fuels need state and federal financial support. That way they can expand their practices to a larger base of people and expand their business, that way they create more job opportunities. This is the same situation for small green businesses who are wanting to expand their product and their base to provide more opportunities. And I say, isn't this what the American dream is all about? So many of us have already proven that we're ready for a new energy economy. And I appreciate the funding and the economic recovery package that has been given to help push this along. But we need to be mindful that this is not gonna happen overnight. We're gonna need sustained funding to keep this movement going and help us move our country in the right direction, both economically and environmentally. I say that our leaders need to take cue from many of these great people who are, have been doing this work on the ground for many years and show how they have led by example as well. If you Finally, could, I wanna if say- you, If you could- Yes, sir. Could Despite the fact that I am talking about these instances with oil and gas industries, I'm not trying to attack the workers. To me, they're heroes because they've sacrificed themselves to help support energy in their communities and their families. So I just would ask that you guys um, support us along the way. There are many people like myself who are gonna help this happen regardless of what support we get from you all, but we know that we can work together with you all to make this happen. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Reynoso, very much. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And Mr. Reynoso, it's a pleasure to have someone from New Mexico taking such bold steps. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am going to have to excuse myself in just a few minutes. I have an opportunity and the privilege of addressing um, an organization of HACU, which many of you are familiar with, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. And I look forward to reviewing the remarks of those that I haven't had an opportunity to listen to in person. I just want to uh, encourage you to continue to be vocal and stay engaged with your local elected officials as well as your congressional leaders. Good. Great. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for being here. Again, we'll ask each of you to just to try to keep your opening remarks to around five minutes, if you could. Um, our next uh, uh, witness is Ms. Candy Mossett. Uh, Ms. Mossett is from Newtown, North Dakota, on the Fort Bethald Reservation. Ms. Mossett has been working with indigenous youth to address the root problems of environmental health through education and promoting clean energy uh, solutions. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Uh, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, for allowing me this opportunity to testify on behalf of the Indigenous Environmental Network and the impacted community members that we work with throughout Indian Country. Uh, the Indigenous Environmental Network is a nonprofit organization established in 1990 uh, by grassroots Indigenous peoples. And basically, we all work together to develop mechanisms to protect. Um, our sacred sites, land, water, air, natural resources, health of our people, and all living things. We work to build localized, economically sustainable economies. We provide support, resources, and referral to communities um, and youth throughout primarily North America, but most recently uh, globally. I began working with IEN in February of 2007 on something called the Tribal Campus Climate Challenge. Since then, over 30 tribal colleges have been engaged on this project. We've done everything from community tree plantings to small-scale community solar panel installations and community gardens. And it has been successful on a small scale, but it's not enough for what we're facing with these climate challenges today. Over the course of the past two years, I've had the opportunity to meet with hundreds of students and grassroots organizers dealing with environmental justice impacts on their lands. I myself am an impacted community member in the community of Fort Berthold, <laughs> um, and we're currently fighting against a proposed clean fuels refinery in which the plan is to pipe tar sands from the First Nations communities in Canada down to my reservation to refine the oil and then of course send the energy somewhere else. We're left with the pollution and contamination. And for those of you who may not know, every one barrel of oil produced in the tar sands produces three times more greenhouse gas emissions than a conventional barrel of oil. In 2003, the North Dakota Department of Health released a fish advisory in North Dakota telling us that 
we should not consume any fish from any of the lakes and rivers, at least dependent upon their size due to the amount of mercury contamination. When mercury gets into the fish, it turns into methyl mercury. When we eat it, it builds up in our bodies, it's cumulative, it never goes away. Young children, developing fetuses, and breastfed babies are the most affected by this. In 2006, with seven coal-fired power plants and one refinery, North Dakota was ranked 14th in the nation for mercury contamination. EPA's own consultants estimate that fine particle pollution from power plants shorten the lives of 34 North Dakotans each year. We are also currently dealing with the effects of the drilling of the oil in the Bakken Formation. North Dakota Senator Byron Dorgan has called for a one-stop oil shop on the Fort Berthold Reservation in order to making the permit process more easier. This is outrageous and it must be addressed. Additionally, North Dakota is plagued by the extraction of the dirtiest coal in the country, lignite coal. 70% of that energy that we produce is shipped out of the state of North Dakota, leaving with the pollution and after effects of the mining. Over the last year, there have been over 30 cancer-related deaths that I know of on the Fort Berthold Reservation. I myself was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer when I was 20 years old. And I'm here to tell you that I don't believe that's a coincidence. Indigenous peoples have been systematically targeted by the fossil fuel regime for years. Many of our tribal leaders have been convinced that they must sell the resources in the land in order to progress. And because our cultures are so dependent on our relationship with the land, we ultimately become economically dependent on our own cultural destruction. And the thing I cannot understand is why so many indigenous peoples are dying every day due to unsustainable mining, extraction, refinement, and storage processes when there is a wealth of renewable energy potential on our indigenous lands. Wind capacity on the Indian reservations in North Dakota and South Dakota alone are equal to 200,000 megawatts. That is enough energy pr to produce one third of America's electricity demands. The solar electricity generation potential on indigenous lands is four and a half times greater than the current U.S. total annual generation. And given all that we know, we, the future of America, are demanding that the U.S. government enact an immediate moratorium on new oil, gas, and coal, and nuclear plant construction and infrastructure while phasing out existing plants and fossil fuel extraction and ensuring a just transition for the workforce in our communities. A just transition means that we create green jobs for rural as well as urban communities. And when we install wind turbines, like the one that was installed on the White Earth Reservation, we get to keep all of this wind power that we produce. That community is using that turbine to power one building. The rest is forced to be sold back to the grid. It, it's got to stop. We have been the battery powering this country for far too long. We suffer the consequences of health and environmental destruction and we receive almost none of the benefits. And it has got to stop. This is no longer affecting only minority and low income populations. It is threatening the destruction of the very thing we as a human species rely on, our mother earth. We must not rely on false solutions like clean coal nuclear energy or carbon capture and sequestration. Clean coal is an oxymoron and a myth because it does not exist. Nuclear energy requires uranium extraction and much of the uranium comes from our indigenous lands. People on the Navajo Reservation, the Diné, are sick and dying today as a result of uranium extraction from decades ago. And the use of nuclear energy leaves behind radioactive waste. It stays in the ground for tens of thousands of years, and the pr proposed storage sites around the country are not the answer to the issue. The answer is to quit producing the waste in the first place. Finally, carbon capture and sequestration technology is unproven and not the answer to our problems. What we need to do is extinguish the carbon emissions at their source and work on not producing it in the first place. Through my work, I have found that many people are searching for what they call traditional knowledge to help solve this crisis that we're facing today. 
But I'm here to tell you that traditional knowledge is not some ancient secret. It is common sense. It is cause and effect. Our unsustainable practices must come to an end. We must be much more energy efficient and wise in the way we use energy, and we must think about the future. As a wise leader once said, Mahatma Gandhi, we certainly have enough resources for people's needs. We do not, however, have enough resources for people's greed. I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come before you to speak today from a very good place in my heart. I hope you take my words seriously and that we have the opportunity to weigh in on future energy choices for the betterment of the health and well-being of all those people that I am here to speak on behalf of and also for those who cannot speak for themselves, the four-legged, the winged, the ones that swim. They can't speak and that's what we're here to speak for today and I welcome the, question, the opportunity to answer any questions to anybody who has anything to say and that includes Mr. Rush Limbaugh, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next witness is uh, Ms. Marcy Smith. Uh, she is a student at Transylvania University and founded the Transylvania Environmental Rights and Responsibilities Alliance, Terra, which is part of the Kentucky Student Environmental Coalition. She most recently served as a youth delegate to the UN Climate Change Convention Conference in Poznan, Poland. Uh, welcome. Uh, whenever you are comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Congressman Markey, and thank you, friends, for this opportunity. Let us cut to the chase. Economically, politically, ecologically, and dare I say spiritually, we are flirting with tipping points. You know the security and economic implications of ignoring these tipping points. You've had the reports on your desk. They have been produced by the most credible sources available. Sir Nicholas Stern, U.S. Intelligence Agency, Five Star Generals, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You know that by 2020 in Africa alone, which has very low adaptive capacity, 75 to 220 million people will face severe water shortages and rain-fed crop yields could be halved. You know that to our south, in Latin America, 50% of agricultural lands are very likely to be subjected to, to desertification and salinization by 2050. And you know what this means for the tensions that already exist in this country over immigration. You know that the Rwandan genocide was driven in large part by the scarcity of arable land. You know that the strife in places like the Congo and the Sudan is exacerbated by environmental degradation and land insecurity. And people much smarter than me have demonstrated compelling links between the growth of terrorism and environmental degradation. You know, or can at least imagine, the precariousness of a world in which more and more and more people have nothing left to lose but their burdens. You know that you're using a straw man argument when you justify legislative inaction by pointing to China and India's industrialization, because you know that both of them have released 21st century energy plans far, far more comprehensive than, than this country has. You know that mountaintop removal coal mining has destroyed thousands upon thousands of miles of headwater streams. You know that children in eastern Kentucky color their water red in coloring books because they don't know it's supposed to run clear. And you know that this constitutes the digging of our own collective grave. You also know that there are 4,000 parts in one solar panel. And you know the promise that this holds for job creation in a moment of historic economic crisis. You know that the moment for short-term thinking and quick fixes is over because you know, as a professor of mine often says, that rearranging chairs on the Titanic did not keep it afloat. You know, as well as Carol Browner has told you, that if you, Congress, do not act on this information with the necessary speed and commitment, President Obama will act unilaterally. 
you know that the regulation of greenhouse gases by the Oval Office would constitute a radical expansion of executive power, and that expansions of executive power rarely mean good things for Congress, our representative body, in the long term. You know that there are two ways to go about addressing climate, the climate crisis, either by fur further centralizing power in the hands of those who already have enough to get them in trouble, or by shifting power back into the capable, creative hands of citizens. You know these things, you've seen the reports. And today, you're getting another report across your desk from a highly credible source. 12,000 young advocates, 12,000 of your constituents, 12,000 of your children who have tirelessly fundraised, educated ourselves, and come bearing solutions, exercising our rights as citizens, which you have sworn to uphold. And we are calling for this power shift. We cross race lines, we cross class lines, we cross gender lines, we cross generational lines, we cross the line between rural and urban, local and global. And thus we are a movement of historic inclusivity and maturity. In my own life, I have had to cross these lines. I have been given a strong sense of place, history, and orientation by my old Kentucky home. And it is old, for my family has been in Kentucky for over 200 years, most of which has been spent on the same land in the same communities. My love of home has only been made stronger by the urban, global perspective that I have been afforded over the past three years. I have had the opportunity to intern here in Congress with Congressman Ben Chandler, to research in The Hague with the Institute for Environmental Security, and to study ecology and conservation in Madagascar. My life, I think, well represents the diversity of perspectives offered by this movement, the savviness and the creativity of urbanity alongside the community orientation, sense of responsibility, and values of conservation represented by non-urban, place-based lifestyles. It also reminds me of our interdependence as humans and as an ecological community, because I stand humble at the feet and proud on the shoulders of those in my family and my community who afforded me all of the opportunities I mentioned. This reminds us likewise that we depend on each other as well as on the earth. Despite the uniqueness, beauty, and generosity of my home, I've been told that it's a flyover state. Perhaps this is why some believe that it would be okay to sacrifice our mountains on the altar of energy independence. Perhaps that is why some think that it is inevitable and conscienceable that the unemployment rate in our coal-producing counties has been stuck at 30% for as long as anyone can remember. Perhaps that is why we think that it is conscionable that there is upwards of 50% of children living below the poverty line in some counties and average income levels in others that are nearly half that the national average. Perhaps we're thought to be disposable, and that's why the media was nowhere to be found after the Martin County sludge spill. 250 million gallons of coal slurry into our rivers and streams, 30 times the amount of oil spilled by Exxon Valdez, declared by the EPA the worst environmental disaster in the recorded history of the southeastern United States. Perhaps that is why we fail to remember that long before Washington caught green fever, people in Bald Knob, Campbellsville, and Owenton, Kentucky, were using rain barrels, composting, using non-toxic all-natural cleaning products, and reminding me that some things are sacred and not to be touched, like our mountains. And in truth, it is these communities that should be getting credit for many of the ideas that we are bringing here today. And in truth, despite their wise behavior, it has been these communities that have lived most precariously under the dirty energy regime. And so a new green economy cannot further entrench the inequities in this country and abroad, or we will have failed. These five million jobs we're asking for, we're also saying that they must first go to places like Appalachia, go to places like Native American reservations, to places like Los, inner city Los Angeles, to people whose livelihoods are currently predicated on the destruction of their health, their homes, their cultures, and their identities. Eco-apartheid and eco-imperialism may reduce carbon emissions, but if we choose this process, it will be like swallowing the spider to catch the fly that's already in our stomach. The delegation of 175 students from Kentucky wants mountaintop removal coal mining gone, and we want alternatives. This is why today, this inclusive, mature movement is not here to simply ask for a carbon cap and green jobs and clean energy. Because you see, the great achievers and problem solvers of human history understood that they could not approach the challenges of their day using the systems of logic that begot the challenges. They had the courage 
required to challenge prevailing assumptions and prevailing systems, and the wisdom required to conserve that which was essential. They struck at the root. Likewise, we are here today striking at the root, testifying that climate change is but a symptom of much older, much deeper inequities and imbalances within the human community, within the ecological community, and within ourselves. We are having a conversation much bigger than climate change. We're having a conversation much bigger than climate science. We are having a conversation about climate equity and climate justice. There will be labor pains before the earth and her people arrive at a new equilibrium, but there is hope because we are increments of the whole and the climate reminds us that incremental changes ultimately result in a holistic, qualitative change. Therefore, today I am not asking for a specific law. You have heard these requests. I am going to take a moment to ask you to join me in reflecting on our intentions as, in as individuals and as a country. What are your intentions? Is your highest intention to get reelected next term, to secure a seat on a bigger and better committee? And so you're willing to give preference to corporations, those legal persons that lack blood, conscience, curiosity, and the capability to feel pride or love or loyalty towards something? Or is your highest intention to preserve that which is essential, the security of your home and your neighbors? Intentions matter. They determine the quality of the process and thus the purity of the product. And our intentions must be more courageous than garnering more power and more profit. Our intentions must be to restore our fractured and imbalanced communities. And my friends, this is indeed revolutionary. The climate reminds us of both our human strengths and our limitations. We are strong for we have discovered that we have the power to move mountains. We have the power to alter the systems that govern this planet. But we are weak because we cannot know the full repercussions of what our blind tinkering will do. We are strong, for we can heal what we have wounded, but we are limited because we cannot do it alone. Given this, the climate also reminds us that our fates are inextricably linked. It reminds us of the artificiality of boundaries because the climate is no respecter of state lines, the product of human whim and war. It reminds us that no one is an island, we are all part of the main. When I was in Poland, I was working to aid the undercapacitated delegation of the Democratic Republic of Congo. At the UN climate negotiations, those countries that have more money have bigger delegations, and because power at the UN climate negotiations is, de is determined by how much information you can absorb, interpret, and respond to, big delegations are more powerful. My decision to stand in solidarity with the DRC drew no small amount of criticism, and during that contentious process, one of their three delegates told me, Marcy, when I was in the... Turned off the microphone down there. Can you go? I think you might have turned off your microphone down there. Just. Climate legislation in 2009. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. And our final witness is uh, Timothy Denherter Thomas, uh, a student at McAllister College in uh, Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Denherta Thomas has worked on his campus and in his community to set up a clean energy revolving fund. Uh, we look forward to hearing about this program. If you could move the microphone over. Uh, whenever you're ready, please begin. Is this working? Yep, it certainly is. Cool. Um, I'd like to thank you, Chairman Markey, um, for this opportunity. 
Um, I would like to share a few of my experiences as just sort of a, an initial hint or a taste of what the opportunity is before us as we actually figure out how we're going to build this green economy. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm a McAllister student. I actually grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. It's a low-income community, uh, polluted sites everywhere, uh, highways intersecting all the way through the county. It's right next to Manhattan, most powerful economy of the world. That kind of distinction, that separation, is, is a huge part of our problem here, and we have to really figure out how we find a way that works. That's really the foundation of my environmentalism, my activism. It's finding a way that works. I think that's the challenge before us, and it unites all people and all places and all types of solutions. I really take to heart an idea expressed by one of our movement visionaries, Van Jones, when he says, as activists, we need to stop complaining about the problems. and Instead, we need to be preparing for governance. I think that's really our role as young people, to start the process of preparing for governance. And I think we can't do that alone. We need all of the leaders in Congress, and we need, every, we need everyone else, you know, from the financiers to the community organizers. We have to do this together. We have to look for ways that we can engage each other and other people in the process. It's not gonna work alone. We're not gonna get to any of these types of solutions by ourselves. We need your help. When I came to McAllister in 2005, um, I was already starting to get connected with other members of the climate movement. Uh, helped other students start green roofs and building insulation, carbon inventories, and you know all of that great stuff. But the con consistent problem I found was that we would think of a project, get some people on board, research the idea, somehow find funding, go do it, and then we're back to square one. And that just reinforced what I think is a common assumption that sustainability and climate solutions and a clean energy economy is expensive and inconvenient. Sure, morally we should do it, we're all on board with that, but you know, if the economy is going down, uh, it's maybe not as high a priority. Um, I don't think that makes sense. I don't think that makes any sense. The way I responded at McAllister was by creating the Clean Energy Revolving Fund, which is basically a finance mechanism that allowed us to invest in simple improvements, you know, light bulbs, building insulation. Um, now we're starting to move on to renewable energy. Uh, and use the, the savings or revenue that that created to um, reinvest in the fund. So it's basically a way to get sustainability to fund sustainability. Um, it's grown to $100,000 at a college of 1,900 students. We got a 40% return in our first year. That's four times the stock market. <laughs> when it's not collapsing. <laughs> I'm also not a financial expert. I'm looking at light bulbs. This is pretty simple. Um, the question for me is, you know, we've, we've generated these huge opportunities at one little college in Minnesota, and it's, you know, spreading to other campuses around the country. What if we were to look at that opportunity nationwide? And it's more than just these simple initial infrastructure steps. It's how it changes the culture. What I saw at McAllister was that once we demonstrated those initial steps, the administration started to see, whoa, this is sustainable. It saves money. It also creates incredible academic opportunities that allow students to invent their own careers. It's creating civic engagement opportunities when people can start to say, how can I take this and apply this to other organizations and other neighborhoods around me? And they've started to commit to far more, more, far more actions than we'd ever imagined. I mean, carbon neutrality, and they're really working intensively with students still as innovators and leaders to figure out how we're gonna make the campus sustainable, but more importantly, use it as a model to trigger far wider change. I think that's exactly the role that we as young people want to have uh, with the government. We wanna be partners. We wanna create innovation that spurs action, but then actually work to continue to create the solutions that we need. What I did on campus was ju really just a model. Over the past two years, I've been focusing much more on implementing it in the community where there's scale. That's really what we need to do. It's all about the scale. What I found is essential is networking. The nonprofits, the local businesses, the labor unions, the local government officials, all of the people who have a stake, who are coming at this problem from many different angles. I found it works. It really does work. 
One of the things I've been doing is starting a, a energy efficiency cooperative called Cooperative Energy Futures, just in early stages, but it's basically replicating the same model we did on campus to the community level, helping neighbors do insulation and weatherization, creating economies of scale so that um, efficiency contractors and you know, the vocational programs that develop this really can kind of scale up their operations. We really need to think about how we break through those barriers. I mean, currently the utilities are telling us, you know, we can't do efficiency. It's only this tiny little piece. It's, it's not gonna fundamentally change the broader picture. And, and the same thing with all these other infrastructure changes that we need. The question I think we need to pose is, how are we really going to apply these types of solutions to 120 million homes? There's $100 billion of savings out there that we're leaving on the table. We're not picking it up. Why? One of the other initiatives I've been involved in is called ARISE. It's the Alliance to Reindustrialize for a Sustainable Economy. A bunch of young people in the Twin Cities were starting to pull together uh, labor groups and nonprofits around um, a Ford plant site that's slated to close in two years. And basically said, you know, we don't just want this to become another, uh, you know, infill development with condos and coffee shops as the term. We want to revitalize, the, revitalize this site with green industry, create 2,000 family supporting jobs, produce more on site energy generation than the site uses. Um, you know, mixed use communities, uh, affordable housing, transit, all fitting that together. The city wasn't thinking about that. But they've decided that the work that we're doing is innovative enough and effective enough that they're actually looking at our plans as a model for what they want to do. And I think that's exactly what we need to do all across the country. And there's hundreds of other youth leaders and hundreds of other community groups who are trying to do exactly the same thing. That's the scale we need. I've had a great time working as an entrepreneur. I'm building a career. I you know, have great career opportunities. This sector is just growing while everything else is sort of not doing so well. Um, it's not just about kind of, you know, having a good time, though. Um, we're creating new industries. We're creating career pathways for thousands of, new pe of other people, you know, all up and down the economic spectrum. I think the training and the capacity building for the type of leadership and the type of organizing uh, that can really make these types of community partnerships happen is, is absolutely crucial. Um, I'm, I'm working on that, and so are, you know, lots of other people all around the country. Um, I'm working through a program called the Summer of Solutions. Uh, that, is, that is trying to train youth leaders in the social entrepreneurship approach. Uh, but we need the support. We need these, these programs that are going to create clean energy cores and, and help people um, really figure out how to tra transition their communities. My final, my final point, and I think really the, the, the agenda that I'm trying to wrap up and drive home here, is that the way we approach the solutions will determine whether we succeed. We're not going to pull this off unless we can figure out ways that everyone who participates can get benefits and that those benefits apply to everyone. When we do you know, a cap and trade, we need to make sure that there's auctioning and that the revenues are actually invested in the solutions. And those solutions are also about the people. They're not just you know, what the utilities are gonna do or you know, what the very large corporations are gonna do. Sure, we need that, but we also need the application and the implementation at the local scale where it actually affects and can help everyday people who are being hurt by this economic crisis. When you're thinking about grid regeneration, you know, super grids are great, but what we really need is a system that's not going to reinforce central station development and is really empowering community participation in the generation and ownership of renewable energy. My friends out in western Minnesota, you know, they get pissed off when all of the large utility companies buy up all the good wind sites and they can't participate. They want to own the wind. They want to be able to be a part of that, of that new economy. Um, what I'm asking you is to really focus on, through your policies, giving us the tools, the structures, and the resources to actually take part in that process and, and invest all of our generation and the broader communities is in it. I'm looking forward to a, a great and long career. I really love being a social entrepreneur. Um, I want uh, to work with, with you, this committee, with all of Congress, and um, with government at all levels. Uh, to communicate this message you know, to the international community at Copenhagen. We as citizens really are the leaders, um, but also we need that support. We need the training. We need not just this is available, but um, the message and the policy to say, we're going to help you figure this out, and we're going to train you in how to lead. 
and we're gonna rely on the innovations and the entrepreneurship of people all across our society to really make it work at the ground level. We hold in our hands as students and citizens the tools we need to bring a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, so um, I'm gonna ask a few questions now, if I may, and I'll begin with you, uh, Jesse. You've got twice the number of people here as you had just 15 months ago at your Power Shift uh, <laughs> Summit. So what's going on, Jesse? I mean, how, this is growing, huh? It, it, it doubled in just 15 months, so talk a little bit about what's going on uh, with the uh, with the green generations. Well, we're just getting started, so we should start with that. Um, what we see, what we've seen happening since 2007, is young people realizing the political power that they have, recognizing that if there is going to be any chance of us solving this problem, they all need to rise up in their local communities all across the country, and that we need to multiply this movement. There may be 12,000 of us that came to Washington, D.C. Uh, this weekend, but nearly 350,000 young people stood up this election season and said, I'm voting for clean and just energy. I'm going to make sure that the candidates running for office, including the president, take strong stances. But we're not just focused on, on passing federal legislation, although that is a clear priority here today. Young people in hundreds of communities across the country, on college campuses, in rural areas, in urban areas. They're not just talking the talk, they're walking the walk. They're making their communities models of the clean, clean and just energy future we're talking about. They're getting their administrations to commit to climate neutrality. They're helping to pass statewide legislation. They're starting green jobs, training programs. They're doing weatherization of low-income housing. So, so we, we come here today not just as a group of people to lobby our Congress, but as a group of people that have been the practitioners of these remarkable solutions. These 12,000 people that have spent the weekend in Washington, D.C. are going back all across the country tomorrow. And they're gonna find 10 new people to join with them by the next month, and 10 more the next month. We will grow this movement by hundreds and thousands of people. And we will create a situation in which there is no other solution for this United States Congress but to pass bold legislation in 2009. Thank you. So do you think, Jesse, that uh do you think that the election of a young, visionary president uh, and more members of the House and the Senate that agree with your position reflects just the beginning of the success story and that there's a lot more that is going to happen? I would say without a doubt. I mean, there was a historic election on November 4th, and the 24 million 18 to 24 year olds that 18 to 29 year olds that turned out to vote, we celebrated that night. But we knew that the real work was going to begin on November 5th, and that we are incredibly proud that we have a champion in the White House, that we have champ more, far more champions in the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. So we're in a much better position than we were when we came to see you in 2007. Great. But we know that our work has just begun and that we'll have to keep the pressure on to ensure we get the kind of action we need. Well, I, I gave you a seat at the table 15 months ago when you were here, and the seat and this table's getting bigger and bigger. And, uh, and Chairman and Markey, if we can make champions all across Congress, all across the country, like the leadership that you have demonstrated, then I think this movement agrees we're in very good shape. Excellent. So you were, um, so Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, you were, you were in Poznan, Poland in December, and, uh, and what I'm wondering is, uh, 
in response to the argument that we might act, but China and India are not going to act, kind of asked the question as a result, are there student activists in China and India that you met? Are there, uh, are there young people who are demanding change in those countries um, that are now joining us in sending this CO2 up into the atmosphere? Most definitely. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And actually, they, they joined us this weekend. We had, I, I was on a workshop um, discussing the relationship between the global north and the global south in climate negotiations. And we had two representatives from, from China uh, alongside the represent, representation from the DRC and from the United States. And so what you're seeing, this is really, truly remarkable, is the creation of an international youth movement. This is not only the United States. This is international because climate change is by definition an international problem. As I said earlier, it, it is no respecter of state borders. And so we have joined hands and we are joining forces with Chinese youth who are, who are agitating, who are working for bold legislation in, in China. And it's really quite exciting, whether it's domestically or internationally, you're seeing incredible reconciliation happening um, between people of you know, the global north and the global south. And it really is quite remarkable. Mr. Uh, Denherta Thomas, uh, the Clean Energy Revolving Fund that, you're, that you've created, that's a very entrepreneurial, um, inventive way of dealing with the issue. Where did you come up with that idea? Um, it was really just starting from the realization that we're wasting a lot of resources uh, and pouring a lot of money down the drain in the fossil energy economy, and that if there was a way to to harness and capture that uh, that waste and turn it towards the solutions, um, it would make a lot of sense. Uh, and so I did a bunch of research and discovered there were like other kinds of revolving fund mechanisms um, at other colleges. Um, I'd never seen it done where kind of students created them, um, but. You know, it was a model that, that had worked and was being done by energy service companies at the community level as well. Mm -hmm. um, so figuring out how to turn that model as a tool for youth leadership and youth activism was really the innovation. But, I mean, it's just an approach that makes sense. Okay, Mr. Uh, Reynosa, can you talk a little bit about solar in New Mexico and what you believe its uh, potential is, perhaps in terms of the megawatts that could be generated of, with solar energy and sent into the cities of California and Texas and other states? Yes, sir. I mean, we have great potential. New Mexico is a very rural state, and so we have tons of land that we could be using to, um, you know, retrieve this solar energy, and it's definitely far more than enough to be powering our state. We could definitely be shipping it off to other places once we do get the grid on track to where it needs to be. We already have companies moving into the Albuquerque area, such as Advent and Shot Solar, who are coming with you know innovative technology with solar troughs and uh, concentrated solar, you know. But what they do need is incentives from the government to help them grow their businesses. I have a lot of friends who are trying to do smaller scale businesses and help make these happen too. And they have the skills and the the hard working and everything to make it happen. And they just need support to grow their business. And I, I have people uh, calling and asking me every day since I am working on green jobs, well, where is the green job? How can I get a green job? And it you know, breaks my heart for me to tell them that's what I'm trying to bring to you. I wish I could have a list of solar panel installation jobs for them to go to and reach out to this company and say, hey, you know, I, I've went through this training program and now I'm ready to work for your company and start you know, installing solar panels on all these houses that you have this demand for. So it's definitely such a high potential and I think we haven't even realized how much we can do with it at this point. Well, you know, President Obama, as part of his campaign in running against John McCain, said that his goal was to have 25 percent of all of our electricity come from renewable sources by 2025, which would be a big, big revolution uh, in our country. And so what I've done is I've introduced that legislation into the committee uh, so that uh, I, as the chairman of the committee, I can now make the case to the other members that this is the visionary way in which we unleashed the solar from the deserts and the wind from the prairies and from the rooftops of uh, people's homes and into the grid and uh, fueling the factories and the commercial uh, activity and the homes of people across our country. So 
Uh, I think you're right on the money, Mr. Reynoso. And I think, I actually think that New Mexico is right in the center yes, of sir. this. Uh, we revolution. definitely appreciate that as well. Yeah, it's, it's the. Uh, You know, it is, it's the center of the revolution, although there's a lot of wind in North Dakota. And, uh, but you talked, Ms. Mossett, about uh, trial solar panel projects. Mm -hmm. Was that in North Dakota? Yes, um, actually, Lakota Solar Enterprises is the first native-owned solar company that's in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, where they're actually manufacturing turbines. It's very small scale, which we at the Indigenous Environmental Network push for because we have to be cautious. Anything that turns into a huge corporate industry can get out of control pretty fast. And our people have access to small scale because it's affordable. And so we install the, we manufacture the panels there and then we ship them out and install them. 800 cubic square feet of a person's home can be heated through the sun, so this is free energy, <laughs> for about $1,200. Mm. And we can do that. That's feasible. And you're right about the wind. The answer is really blowing in the wind. And it's so unfortunate that we're such a huge fossil fuel state. Well, you know, you, we're going to unleash that wind, though. We are going to do it. Back in 1996, uh, we were still a dial-up nation. Not one home in America had broadband not one home in 1996. So I was the chairman of the Telecommunications Subcommittee. And that subcommittee, I introduced the legislation in 1993. And by 1996, uh, with the help of uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore, that became the law. So by changing from narrow band to broadband, 10 years later, we moved from a black rotary dial phone to blackberries. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved to a whole new vocabulary 10 years later that is eBay and Amazon and YouTube and Google and all the rest of these brand new technologies that created thousands of companies and three million jobs in our country. I so what we have to do is to create the same thing for energy right. because the Sergey Brins and the Larry Pages and the Bill Gates and the um, and uh, uh, the candy mossets are out there, ready to go. <laughs> They're ready to, to invent this new economy uh, for our country and for the world, by the way, because otherwise we will be importing mm -hmm. these products from China, from India, from Germany. Exactly. It's not a choice. You know, you, 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 it's not like if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. It is going to happen. And the only question is who's going to... Uh, be employed by it? Are they going to live in New Mexico or North Dakota or Minnesota or Kentucky? Or are they going to live uh, in Shanghai, in New Delhi, uh, in uh, Bonn or uh, Berlin or some other community around the world? And that's our big choice. So um, the, the interesting thing is that it, the telecommunications revolution has made possible the energy revolution. In other words, what we're going to have to build is an electric internet, an energy internet, because we have to manage this electricity as we bring it in from the prairies, right. as we bring it in from the deserts, as we take it off of rooftops. We're now going to have to manage it. And so the telecommunications revolution, the broadband revolution, will make it possible for people to walk around with their own iPods managing their electricity back in their home, back uh, in uh, their business. Uh, it will allow us to move in this electricity from the rural parts of the United States uh, into the cities. So the first revolution created three million jobs, driven by young people who were the inventors, the entrepreneurs, the workers. And now we have a second revolution that is now made possible because of it. And these two revolutions go hand in hand because they're much uh, the same people. They're the young people. They're technology oriented. Uh, they want to make a difference. Uh, and if government got out of the way <laughs> and these big vested interests got out of the way, this revolution would take place and be completed in 10 years. Uh, we would change our relationship with, uh, with all of these fossil fuels that uh, have been bedeviling our national security, our health, our environment, and our economic uh, prosperity for generations. So that's uh, what our real challenge is. And, uh, uh, and thank you, Ms. Mossa, for your work. Because Bringing solar to North Dakota doesn't seem like that makes a lot of sense. But you're saying 
it makes a lot of sense if people would just give you the the room to be able to make it work. Huh? Exactly. It's not only one thing. It's a combination of things that we have to do to make this new energy economy. It's not just solar. It's not just wind. It's a combination. And I understand and appreciate everything that you have done. It's just, you know, for me, I, it, it's not fast enough. We've been dealing with this for decades and decades and decades. And only now that it's affecting so many more people has it really become something that's been put on the table. And so, you know, 35 people that I know, my relatives, were put in the ground this last year. And, and when you think of that one year, and it, and it increases every year, when you're saying we can do it in 10 years, that I'm saying that's not good enough. I'm saying let's do it faster. Let's do it faster, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we can't, we cannot operate at the pace, obviously, that these older industries want us to uh, move at. Uh, AT&T testified in 1981 that there would be one million people using cell phones in America in the year 2000. Uh, and so if you listen to the CEO of AT&T, uh, all of you would still be walking around with uh, Campbell soup cans and a, and, a, and a piece of string, huh? Talking to each other. But of course they were wrong because they controlled. The reason they thought there would only be one million is they controlled. So we had to change the dynamic whereby there would be not one cell phone company, not two, but three, four, five, six. And then the, the fifth and the sixth say, hey, why go analog? Why not go digital? Why charge 50 cents a minute? Why not charge seven cents a minute? And then all of a sudden, you've got, you've got television shows and, uh, and data and, uh, and everybody is going, well, of course this is the way technology should be operating. Why did it take just 10 years once you got it right? Well, the same thing I think is going to happen in the energy sector. I think that we'll have thousands of new choices that people will have to select from uh, in order to uh, create this revolution that will be the green jobs revolution. It'll be, it will have green jobs factories all across the country. That's what's going to happen. And it will be, and it will be because of you. So what I'm going to do is ask each one of you, we'll go in reverse order, to give us the one minute, just one minute, that you want us to remember over this next year as we're considering a renewable electricity standard, uh, an electricity uh, 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 internet going out into rural uh, America to bring in the renewable uh, energy, passing a climate change bill that the president can take to Copenhagen. What's the one minute that each one of you uh, would give to us? Uh, we'll begin with you, Mr. Uh, Denherta Thomas. Chairman, you mentioned that um, the internet really revolutionized communication. And I think the key ingredient there is that it empowered access and collaboration and the ability of everyone to contribute. And I think that's really what made the IT revolution so significant. My worry is that the way we will approach climate solutions will try and do renewable energy, but it will not allow people to contribute. And I think that's essentially what we need. We need to create the tools, the resources, and the infrastructure for everyone to work together to actually make it happen so that it's not just bringing in lots of energy from the rural areas because a lot of folks you know, in my communities are really scared about what happens if we're stringing power lines across our rural landscape. How do we localize it and, and empower the local solutions that will actually make it work and can be done by everyday people who benefit? Well, I can promise you that if AT&T had had its way, there would have been a broadband uh, bottleneck and it would all have been controlled back out in the central station and not with the power being given out to individuals uh, in their homes and where they work. So that's our challenge and we have to ensure that any laws that we pass uh, create that revolution. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I think that I would want to reiterate the fact that this is a movement for green jobs, yes, and for clean energy, that it's also uh, a climate justice movement. I want to echo Timothy when he says that, you know, we want to shift power back into the hands of, of citizens, you know, to allow them to take part in this clean energy revolution. I think that a really important thing um, to remember as we're doing this, that the intentions that inform um, this process are very, very important. I think that the definitions that inform this process are very important. How do we define progress? How do we define development? 
these are things that we need to be thinking about as citizens and as a country. And, and I would you know, urge Congress people and my peers alike as we go about our work to, to be very, very critical you know, of ourselves and of each other uh, to make sure that our intentions are in the right place. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Mossett. Uh, thank you. I would just like everybody to remember that there is a lot of renewable resources on indigenous lands. We have a lot to offer. And in this new arena that we're entering, we need to be at the table. You know, I, I once heard somebody say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. No longer. <laughs> we're, we're here. We're willing to step up. We're ready. And we have uh, really high unemployment rates on the reservations, and we're disproportionately impacted. And yet we have all of this potential. And so we want to be brought on board. We want to be part of that conversation. We want those jobs. And you know, we just want, when we, when we tell you these stories and we tell you these things, it comes from a good place. We're doing it because we know that everybody here is the same. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. We're all human beings. And this is going to positively impact all of us. This isn't, oh, geez, give us some energy. This is for all of us. Just remember that because if we, if we really make this earth that we're living on more sick than we already have, she will no longer support us. She'll shake us off like an old batch of fleas on a dog and say, bye-bye, now I'm going to heal myself. You won't be here, but oh, well, too bad for you. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reynosa. One of the biggest pieces to me in this movement is rebuilding communities. The reason I use the example of my father is because I wanted people to picture their family members, their mother, their father, their brother-in-law who has to work in these industries who could have a better opportunity. And I think that's the great perspective to have when we're moving into this movement and realizing that we need to include everybody, single mothers, at-risk youth, even ex-offenders, they all deserve a second chance. And if we're gonna be going into something new, green, innovative, you know, we need to be innovative with our thinking. And I think that's a great perspective to have. And one of the things that we also need to be leaning away from is just the corporate lobbyists who are trying to tell us otherwise, because I think this is a beautiful movement and we need to let it flourish and become that. Great, thank you, Mr. Renosa. And, um, and Jesse, you have the final word. You're the, you're, <laughs> you're the, you're the cleanup hitter. You've, you've helped to organize these two incredible conferences. So what's the final message? Well, when you came and spoke to us in 2007, and you talked about the energy bill that you were trying to get passed, uh, you heard an audience of people say, we want more. And you said you wanted more too. And six months later, you invited me into your office to, to show me the ICAP bill which in our opinion to date is the strongest piece of legislation we've seen, we've seen out there. And we thank you for not compromising, for hearing that we wanted more. So I guess uh, I would leave today by saying, please do not compromise our future away. Help us maintain the urgency that this cannot fall off the priority list. And know that we are behind you every step of the way in making sure that this Congress passes a strong climate bill and energy bill in 2009. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank uh, all of you for being here. Um, there's not going to be a more important briefing in Congress this year than what we heard here today. And, uh, and we, because you represent the future, you represent not only the future of your own communities, of our country, but of the whole planet. Because if the United States is not the leader, but the laggard, then we cannot solve this problem. And so you are here giving leadership to Congress and to the world uh, by your efforts. And we thank you uh, for that. And uh, as uh, we move through this political process, we're gonna need you to become even more active. And that activity will have to show up in your local communities because Congress is a stimulus response institution and there's nothing more stimulating than thousands of students in your home district coming to visit your office to ask you how you're going to vote on key issues. So that will be your biggest challenge, back in your home campuses, back in your home states, in order to accomplish that goal. So as you go back, the 12,000 of you, you are, you are not only advocates for, a, for uh, for Congress, but you now have to be advocates in your own congressional districts because we need a majority in order 
to win. And you have that power in your hands to accomplish that goal. We thank you for being here. We thank you for your vision, for your courage. And with that, this briefing uh, is uh, adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.